This is The End Show, and I'm your host, Gus Summers. Good to be back with you today. That's right. We are broadcasting live from the Sunset Strip, from our In Show studios, from the entertainment capital of the world, Hollywood, and we have a great in-studio guest, Mr. Mark Devendorf. How are you, Mark? Well, how are you doing? No complaints. You know, excited to have you here. You have a great film that I'm dying to talk about is, you know, vampirism, vampires. I think it's a, it's always been a popular subject, but uh, I think you've captured um, something interesting in the mythology and also the psychological realms. I think it's fascinating, but you know, let me ask you a little bit about yourself. You're, you're a filmmaker, you're a script writer, you edited this particular movie. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. How you got started? Uh, I got started in my high school AV club where we had wake a weekly closed circuit broadcast, and I just really liked editing and playing with music and s images, and kind of started that way. And then uh, uh, I went to UC Santa Cruz, and then I uh, saw the Satyajit Ray, the Indian filmmaker, and like. That was the one where I'm like, oh, I want to be a filmmaker now, is seeing that. But, you know, as a kid, I loved movies, too, like Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark and nice. all those things. But, <laughs> but yeah, the seeing, seeing that, it just seemed, he had, there was so much humanity to it and so, so much beauty. And I was like, wow, this can be really, like, literature almost, you know? Whereas most of the stuff is kind of like when you, like, as a kid, it's pretty pop and, and fun. But right. it doesn't really feel like it uh, has that much depth, I guess. Right. You, you know, it, it's fascinating that you say that because... That, that's always been my point of contention that uh, a, f a good film can be like a great novel mm -hmm. you know it can inspire you you know and drive you to something bigger better you know it, were there films that uh, really capture you that still are with you today like man, you know that scene or that film that actor you know still comes up you know vivid in your mind Sure, sure. If, uh, uh, there's this, his uh, Sajid Ray's film, Charulata. It's a very like low-key <laughs> film. It's yeah. like most of it's indoors about this woman who, yes. who's married who can't even really go outside, and she falls in love with her cousin, and uh, and it's it's just so beautiful. And um, I I went on to work at the Sajid Ray archive um, and would read some of the original Indian uh, literature and yes. uh, watched all of his movies, and then you know I went. They discovered Kurosawa, and so you know Yojimbo and Rashomon and Seven yes. Samurai. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. So, so do, you know the the foreign aspect really draw you? Is that something that uh, you're drawn to even today? Uh, you know, it there's there, I feel like those filmmakers, especially there, it's that international language of cinema. Yes. Like I don't really watch any other Indian films. I, okay. I, I watch. I do like Japanese sure. uh, films, but. Uh, there's just something that was so unique about that, and uh, with with uh, Akira Kurosawa, you would watch his films, and you had no idea about what the culture w was, like the Jedi Geki period. You like read about it later, but uh, right. yes. um, but it just was this whole other world, and Indian culture is so different and so unique, and you know there's so many layers to it. And I just I was I was fascinated by that, and I think Sajid Ray is, uh, is very literary too, and so he. Kind of his his films still still hold up and in my actually teach a uh, intro to cinema class and I always show some of his films and some students really love it and the other ones it's a little too slow for them but for me it's it's just like music it's just paced and, and, and beautiful right you know mentioning all that I want to we're going to be talking about your film I, I can see those elements mm. and that was one of the things um, I was going to mention about the pace the mm -hmm. pace felt good but you know get into that in a little bit. But, you know, a lot of these movies that you mentioned have a, like your film, has this psych psychological little edge to them. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's something that appeals to you as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, my writing partner and directing partner, uh, Mauricio Chernovetsky, he and I, when we discovered uh, Sheridan Lafanu's story, uh, yes. Carmilla, and I, I was just reading a lot of uh, kind of... Uh, kind of fiction at the time, Arthur Machen and all these other writers that uh, never really got to, aren't in the mainstream anymore, but they uh, they have a kind of weirdness. Or, uh, and so I was reading that and I had him read Carmilla and he said, yeah, there is some, uh, Mauricio said, yeah, there is something here. And then we just started talking about it and breaking it down. And we're, you know, realize, oh, there's this whole layer of it. And then you realize 
this character of the mother is like hovering over this ghost character that's barely mentioned in the novella, but you then you make all these connections and breaking down uh, Carmilla as much as we could uh, yielded a lot of interesting uh, stuff that we wanted to then explore in the film. And the, and the thing about Carmilla, the uh, novella, is that there's been sort of remakes. Not, nothing's really. There are a lot of films that say they're based on it, like this 70s Italian film called Vampiros Lesbos, which had a, a kind of great soundtrack, but little else that was going forward, or uh, Roger Vadim's Blood and Roses, or even um, Vampire, that are influenced by it, but really don't have anything to do with it. And the other ones, they'll sometimes be straight adaptations that are trying to go for the most salacious parts, which are obviously uh, the lesbian vampire aspect. But, you know, <laughs> La Fanu's Carmilla is really has a lot of depth and really is subtle and it's about this tension between these two girls that you know that in the book it's there's nothing too overtly sexual but it's the tension that we were interested in right. and so we thought it's really got some truth to say about like the teenage obsession with death uh, you know the relationships we have and uh, and also what what fill when your life is built around a lie what fills that void that has to be filled and that's when we started writing uh, the script and having these long conversations and long walks and like what about this aspect and it was really you know uh, it really took a long time to kind of like figure out all the elements we wanted to get there and um, you know st strip away the p things that we didn't really think were that relevant uh, La Fanu's Carmilla was written before Dracula and was uh, Dracula was heavily influenced by it but uh, all the imagery that we're now used to seeing with the vampirism, like the fangs and the uh, stakes and all that stuff, comes from Dracula. But we, we tried to make a film that pretended, what if Dracula and that other kind of more masculine ideas of vampirism uh, hadn't been made, what would that world look like? And that's, that's what we tried to explore with uh, Mysteria. Oh. Get, Curse of Mysteria. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, I was hoping to... Um, read the story again I had uh, read it mm -hmm. you know a, I'll just say a few months ago mm -hmm. but it's uh, because there was a time because uh, I'll get on topics and I'll begin to read you know read sure. you know, Dracula or read uh, Camilla and uh, Vampire uh, you know, John uh, Polidori mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, know, you know all these all these uh, aspects so yeah that's funny that you mentioned uh, exactly something I was going to I'll the say, proto it, it, the vampire. You're right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, the feminine aspect, mm -hmm. because one of the things that draws me to film, to books, what have you, is a the psychological, mm -hmm. you know, the the metaphysical. Sure. Because right, if you look at the surface of it, you think there is some sort of lesbian attraction, sure. but it's only a form of connection which is leading to something else which is, you know, the manipulation of the young woman. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what you were striving for. Look at where the story is going. It's not this one thing. Yeah. There is deeper issues going on there. Absolutely, and there has to be a dynamic. You know, if you're not going to invite this kind of, you know, vampiric person, this Carmilla, into your house, unless you have, you know, any healthy person would say, I want to stay far away from her as possible. She's an un, you know unhealthy member of the herd. <laughs> Um, sure, you know she's the wolf, right. and uh, and Lara, uh, the character in uh, Styria, is really uh, psychologically damaged because of her history and because of the right. the lies she's been told, yes. and so she's trying to, in a way, discover a truth. You know, right? You, you know, an aspect about that is that you mentioned that you know why she's with her father. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the whole the whole reason, and you know, you allude to that. And again, you know, draws you further into the story where a young person is susceptible mm -hmm. to influence. Yes. You know, how I took it is, or how you can take it, you have someone who's savvy, humanly savvy. You have people who, you know, children, teenagers, adults, who just know the human psyche and are able to manipulate someone else. Mm -hmm. Because that's how it started off. She just knew where to, uh, yeah. Camilla knew where to get to Laura. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. You know, in perfect display of alienation, all your men, they're, they're brutes or, yeah. they're, <laughs> or they're fools. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, that was brilliant. Uh, that was, uh, I thought that was you know, brilliant writing. I think you captured something there. You know, how close did you want to stay um, 
to the book because you had the accident. Sure. You had yeah. you know the, the person you know coming in, staying with them, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, uh, we were interested in a lot of aspects of it. I mean, really the truth that we felt like it was there. Uh, the original story, I think, is taking place in like the 1870s. Right. And we, I think we, we, we also, you know, we grew up as teenagers in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And we kind of wanted to bring those truths that we, ha we had found. And we kind of, the film is set in, the, uh, in 89, you know, just before the fall of the, uh, the Iron Curtain. But uh, that was like when we were teenagers, and we kind of could like identify with those symbols of, uh, like the Walkman or you know the, these strange magazines that you could only find in you know yeah. obscure uh, bookshops or music. You know, obviously, is like a big part of it, and that right. '80s music and that goth kind of sound of like uh, Joy Division or Susie and the Banshees. Nice. And, um, yeah, and we so we wanted to take those elements because I feel like they'd resonate a little more because otherwise, uh, it, you know, you make a period piece, it feels like you can keep it at a distance. But the '80s and the '90s, it's just a little bit out of our reach of memory, and so it it feels it, we try to make it timeless, but it feels like there's something still there that's that we can all remember a little bit, but it's not immediate. And obviously, you know, before cell phones yeah. and before all this other stuff that. Right. has made teenagers so incredibly boring these days. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, because one of the things I, I, I liked about it is the Western culture only had small glimpses of what happened behind the Iron Curtain. So you yeah. put it somewhere where we could only guess what was happening. Yeah. So, you know, seeing a Walkman, we would assume, well, that could even be today. You know, yeah. Or, you know, a few years, just a few years ago, because they weren't exposed to, you know, the West, uh, Western yeah. Uh, technology like we were over here. Well, so. you know, growing up in the, you know, I, we were on the edge of that, you know, communism, where it was like communism was like behind the Iron Curtain. It was this dark, yes. primordial, you know, like, you know, a, a, half of the population could have been villagers and living in castles from what we knew. And it was just like the dark other, you right. know, like, oh, yes. it's, yeah, you have to hold them at arm's length. They're very, you know, you can't even imagine how terrible things are behind there. And that's, as a, you know, as a teenager, as a writer, that's, that's some compelling fodder for the imagination. It's just like, oh, the other, that. And there was almost something about dark and feminine about that wall, about the yes. communism. That right. we, that we just, oh, they're evil and they're dark. And they, they're kind of like, you know, James Bond villainesses. That's yeah. all we knew. That's yeah, right. The evil empire yeah. and everything else. Yeah, because that's how they were portrayed. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you caught that and and also the the whole gothic yeah you know they was brilliant putting uh, Stephen Ray as a professor looking mm -hmm. at a fresco mm -hmm. in an old castle that you mm -hmm. know that, that was pretty imaginative uh, are you are you a um, a uh, art aficionado do you is just something that came along with the story you know I was we were looking for kind of like visual inspiration we came across and we knew about them before but the symbolists the symbolist painter movement and they yes. were always you know combining sex and death right and uh, in such strange imagery that, you know, I feel like as a teenager, you're like when you're also being introduced to uh, your your own sexuality, there's also your own mortality somehow coming in, sure. and they and they kind of get um, smashed together. So yeah, we were uh, there was this I can't remember the name, but there's this uh, a Jewish painter who was in uh, like a concentration camp, and he, yeah. and the uh, one of the SS officers liked his painting, so he'd have him paint these murals, and then um, World War II passed, and he was killed. And then um, during like the cover of night, some uh, I think some Israeli operatives went in and stole the uh, from the building, actually carved out of the wall the murals he's created because he was actually a pretty great uh, Jewish artist, yes. and pulled them out. And then the buildings were destroyed. And so when we heard that story, we thought, oh, that's such an interesting element. And you yeah. know, it goes into that too, that magic mountain aspect of like the spas. Yes. Too. It's it, nice. Yes. It's, it's not something we have really at all here, or even think about it. But you know, the spas, if you were sick or had you know dying of consumption, which yes. in is one interpretation of uh, what's happening to Lara is right. you know it's dying of consumption. And in a vampire film, you know, <laughs> you want people to be dying of consumption. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> Versus you, something else. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you go to these spas and you sit in these spas and these right. treatments that would heal you. They were for the very wealthy. That. Yes. Uh, it, you know, it was another kind of strange otherness. And when uh, we went to Budapest and a few other countries, you go to the spas there that have these beautiful ancient traditions, yes. and you go and sit them, and it just feels like a completely different world. And uh, you know, it does still have that underlying aspect of curing someone of some horrible disease that actually doesn't really help them, but probably 
I think you, I think if going to the spas, if you had consumption, would actually probably kill you faster. It, right. Yeah. <laughs> Just being in a moist environment it, all the time. Exactly. I was going to say that they always take good warm weather, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because the, because that was a little something that you had in the film, which was, you know, the, the castle was built on an ancient bathhouse, sure, or Roman bathhouse, yeah, and which for me, anyways, led to the thought of, you know this society was built on one that was older and mm -hmm. you know we know that the Greeks came before the Romans and the, yeah. the Phoenicians so how far does this go because the frescoes when I was looking at gave hint mm -hmm. to all that yeah yeah and, and I love the whole well, I don't want to give too much away I want people to <laughs> yeah absolutely the uh, the yeah I mean you know in the United States it would be an ancient Indian burial ground but you know there's right. there's there's blood in the ground and uh, there's a lot of history and you know, there are these sites in, you know, Europe where, you know, it used to be a, a pagan place and then they'd tear it down and build a church, church and then yeah. they'd tear it down and build. But, you know, there's still something about that ground. And actually I was visiting Wales and I came across a, a Roman, a, a ruin of a Roman bathhouse. And you just kind of connect with that ancient history. And again, we're always, and it goes exactly what you're saying, that psychology, psychological idea of, you know, something dark that we can't quite remember, but it's somehow still part of our memory or our history. Right. And, you know, and... I know there, there's there's a couple of different issues, you know, but I love the, the psychology of it. Mm -hmm. uh, since you mention it, and you know everyone's pretty aware of it, that everything that was superstition now is just of the mind. Yeah. Even things that they can't explain. You know, oh, it, it, it was something in your mind, and it's yeah. something that you, you, did you purposely want to kind of capture that? Because we talked about the clusters. Yeah. Know, and some of the uh, yeah the that verbiage. That we did, we did some research, and actually, I read this Fordian Times article about suicide clusters, which yes. is this real psychological phenomenon. Which is in some isolated town, something happens to like the psychological fabric of the place, and one teenager or young one person will die or commit suicide, and then their cousin will commit suicide, and then, and pretty soon, in a town of 2,000, you know, you have uh, you know 30 large, deaths, yeah, a large percentage, yeah, and um, whereas you know, uh, 200 years before, and that never happened. And it actually happened in Wales um, a few years back where th 30 teenagers uh, killed themselves within a two-year span, and 18 of, them, 18 of them had hung themselves from the exact same tree. And it's this, like, horrible thing to imagine, and, and sci uh, psychologists call it suicide clusters, yes. which is a nice name for it, but they can't really explain it, and they don't know why it ends. <laughs> And then I realized as I was researching some and reading some of the really old literature about vampirism is that is vampirism. That's exactly what would happen. And in the, in the kind of folklore version, a young person is, kills themselves. And then that person, the person who killed themselves, goes and visits their cousin and either right. kills them or convinces yeah. themselves to kill themselves. And pretty soon all this is happening until they dig up the body of the original person, chop off the head, burn it, scatter the ashes in the river or something. Yes. And... You know, so I think it's a pretty big discovery for uh, that vampirism exists. Vampires don't necessarily exist, but right. the the phenomenon of vampirism right. exists. We now call it suicide clusters. Yes. But if if you did not have the psychological uh, verbiage for uh, to f try and figure out this what this was that suddenly young people are killing themselves when they weren't before, how do you explain it? And vampirism makes perfect sense as c emerging from that. And even psychologists have a different name but they still can't really explain anything about it so it's 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 a fascinating kind of like uh, idea and it and we're suddenly and it suddenly made sense why vampirism would emerge and emerge is such a threat that no one could fight it's an invisible phantom right. that, that exists in the psychological realm you know it, it's it, as you mentioned that you know i think because everyone has a a certain definition of you know vampires, vampirism, vampirism. You know, thinking immediately, you think of Dracula. Sure. Uh, it, uh, yes, in in the broader sense, that it is life draining. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's manipulating something, someone to do something other than that they normally would do, which is drawing the life out of them. Hence, yeah. vampirism. And it's interesting that you mention you know all that because I think of um, that recent story. Uh, Shadow Man. What's um, oh the slender or the skinny whatever? Yeah, yeah. about the making the, the teenagers sacrificing to ex some exactly. exotic uh, internet meme or something. Right, you know they're not sacrificing themselves, but yeah. they're manipulating and sacrificing someone else. Sure, you know here is the power of the mind, I suppose. And yeah, the susceptibility of someone who is, and it makes perfect sense. It was teenagers because. Exactly. 
they're in that realm of just like somehow you can just like get something a little bit off and suddenly you know they're you, yeah, killing you, people <laughs> which you know if you look at all the things that have been happening now about the school shootings mm -hmm. and you know the, the, those those sacrifices teenagers yeah you know again you know we've just learned that you know your mind's not fully developed you're 25 yeah you know fascinating so you, know, you think about even people who are in their 20s and 30s still being susceptible. And you look at people who, for instance, uh, when you're a teenager, you look at your neighbor who's 40, mm -hmm. why do they seem so mature or mentally strong? Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> well, besides life experience, you know, they're not as susceptible. They're more skeptical. Yeah. And, you, and you, I find all that interesting. And you kind of play into that. Like Stephen Ray, he's, mm -hmm. he's all, it's okay, honey. He knows something's going on, but he's caught up with, what he's doing, yeah, yeah. But he knows what happened previously. He knows what's happening, but he is, you know, kind of in his own bubble. Yeah, and you know, I think, I think, as a teenager, you, you, you know, you as a kid, you're kind of like fed these stories, like the, the you know, uh, the boogeyman, boogeyman, yeah. tooth fairy, you know, Santa Claus. And as a teenager, you're like discovering half your childhood was a lie, <laughs> and uh, uh, with with that, you're just kind of immediately mistrust everything that's being said, right. and. There's a really important, you know, a hidden secret that Lara doesn't know about her past that yes. her father's kept hidden, right. and um, is actually based on a friend of mine who, uh, or the, she was this, in the bad lack of better terms, she was a failed abortion. Her mom tried to abort her, uh -huh. and she uh, didn't know this, and somehow she found out in her teenage years that her mom hadn't wanted, her, in fact, to try it. But the abortion didn't take, and she grew up, and she just had this rage within her that yeah. she'd always kind of sensed that that her mom wasn't telling about, and then to find it out, yeah. and I thought I thought if you're if you're if there's a big cavity of something you're not being that's there, and your parents are reacting to it, and you know it's there, and it's purely you know psychological, right. then it's like this abscess forms and this dark thing forms, and that's what's far, formed in Lara, this lie that her father has perpetuated, and he's not told her this great truth about her, and that abscess of that wound is what allows Carmilla to come in and manipulate her. Yeah, exactly. You know, they were great. I mean, that's, that's a great summation of that, because I think that's what draws people in, the person, mm -hmm. what they're thinking, you know, mm -hmm. what's happening to them, because you want to figure that out, is everybody... Everyone has a scar, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever it is. You know, yeah. Billy Joel, you know, pushed me off the swing when I yeah. was eight, and you know, I want to get back at him all these years yeah. or what have you. Do you think that was a a driving force for you in the film? You know, that real psychological. You don't want to say too much. You don't want to have too much happening because the entire film is subtle. Yeah. You know, the, you know, there's action, there's things, or but it's everything is subtle. It's within the, the motion of the scene. It's in within the, the words, but there aren't a lot of words. There aren't a lot of dialogue, but it's all poignant dialogue, you know, yeah. right to the point. Kind, kind of what you were trying to grasp, let the person kind of get their own understanding of what uh, the story was about and what you were trying to present to them. Yeah, we. I'm really fascinated with the like the ambiguity, ambiguities of, you know, a horror film. And my, yeah. uh, my favorite uh, um, is The, uh, the Innocents. Uh, with Deborah Kerr, and uh, yeah. it, you know, it's this. Am you know, you're trying to figure out is she crazy? Are there really yeah. ghosts? It's, it's. I'd say yeah. it's probably the best horror film ever made. Right. right. Um, and then there's the ending, which is so shocking, and it's nothing, nothing overtly sexual or violent, but it was so shocking at the time. It got the film an X rating in Britain, <laughs> and just the idea. Right. You know, it's just yeah. such a, a horrendous <laughs> idea that that people were appalled, and we and we love that ambiguity because when you're dealing with the horror, unless you're just like you know, tearing up bodies and stuff like that, you're really talking about, like, a kind of psycho, like, is the person crazy? Because, or is, are these things happening? And if so, why are these things happening? Right. And we were interested in Laura's character. Is is she causing these problems? Is she experiencing it? Right. Um, one interpretation is she, when you're uh, dying of um, consumption, when you're dying of tuberculosis, yeah. towards the end, the world starts looking really beautiful. And, right. and we thought... Let's let's go that let's go that route and let that kind of ambiguities right. and not you know not everyone loves the ambiguities but the people <laughs> yeah. who do like that kind of yeah. storytelling where you get to really decide and I've had people come up to me after the film and I think I can say this without giving anything away and they go Lara is a vampire she was a vampire the whole time and they can ex emotionally argue it 
and then I just say, well, what about this aspect? And, right. then, and then suddenly, you know, they're deflated. Or other people are like, no, 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 this is this is all in our head. But you know, right. it, it's we try and we try and create something where if you think about it, you can come up with the answers because the the answers are there. But you know, yes. it's a good film to talk about. I think afterwards, you want right. coffee or a, some wine or something, <laughs> or, on a, or on a talk show. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> because you know exactly that. Because you don't know, you have glimpses of her as a child, mm -hmm. which can lead you to something. It, but again, I think if you know the story, yeah. you know, if you've read the story or know about it, it can lead you in a certain direction. Her time at her school. Yeah. You know, all these little things can lead you in, you know, different directions. Yeah. And I think it's what you're, um, what everyone's alluding to. It could be for this reason. It could be for that reason. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a great glimpse into that. Yeah, and if you have a, a movie with a big... Shocking, shocker, and he wants Stephen Ray yeah. somewhere nearby to, yeah. so he can react to it. Yeah, that's right. He's a, he's a great reactor. He is. He is. You Especially know. in the crying game and oh, interview yeah. with the vampire. Oh, he's great in that. He's he's one of those actors like like I was mentioning. You're you're waiting for him. Mm -hmm. What's he gonna do? What's yeah. what's happening? And, and, and he has that Irish darkness and wants a little bit of intrigue that draws you in, hopefully. And then the, you know, yeah, absolutely, the looks, the voice, you know, absolutely. Yeah. I think you, you hit it right on the head. <laughs> that, that Irish irony or uh, intrigue. Yeah. Fantastic. Mark, I got to take a quick commercial right. break, but uh, we still got another segment to, uh, you know, dive more into the film without diving into the film and giving anything that, away. Yeah, <laughs> as best we can. That's right. Mark, again, thanks for taking the time coming in. Appreciate it. Hey, well, this is Gun Summers, and you've been listening to The In Show. We have in-studio guest, Mr. Mark Devendorf, and we've been talking about his film, and we've just been getting somewhat into the nooks and crannies of the story, and we're going to do a lot more of that in our next segment. So you hang in there. We'll be right back. And this is The In Show, and I'm your host, Gus Summers. It's good to be back with you today. That's right, we are broadcasting live from the Sunset Strip, from our In Show studios, from the entertainment capital of the world, Hollywood, and we got a great in-studio guest, Mr. Mark Devendorf. You know, we've been having a wonderful discussion just about the film itself, but there's so much, you know, within the story, uh, within your film, uh, that you can branch out in every way, and when you, for me, when I was watching it, my mind started going in different directions. Mm -hmm. Because again, you know, we can look at it as a, a, a gothic film, yeah. uh, a, a psychological study of, mm -hmm. you know, between teens, uh, between you know, parent and child, uh, between community, yeah. uh, the uh, mythologies of community, and you know, what a, an, a foreigner entering into a community, you know the. the the superstitions, yeah. you know, the metaphysical, the psychological, you, know, you, you can go literally any direction. Yeah, one thing that really helped with that was, uh, I think, too, our location. We shot it in Hungary in this little town outside of Budapest that uh, we actually spent a few months trying to find the right castle. It couldn't be, they, you know, after the fall of communism, some cast, uh, castles just went into disrepair and became ruins. Other ones were fixed up and, you know, sold to uh, millionaires and movie stars to live in. <laughs> But we found this one yeah, in this town of Tura that uh, it's just like there was the roof wasn't quite there and some things were falling apart and it was just in this beautiful, perfectly gothic version of decay. And once we saw that place, we thought, okay, we can make the film. We had actually gone to Austria and Poland and a few other countries, but it was it was Budapest, and Budapest is one of those definitely places of the, of the other where it seems like. A timeless place where you know yes some technologies have changed but communism kind of made things feel frozen and you know it's the a land of you know Ares, Elizabeth Bathory or Elizabeth nice. you know the blood goddess yes. who, uh, who uh, you know uh, is the, you know the great female serial killer <laughs> that but you know the, the brutality of she wasn't that far from it uh, the rest of the brutality but there's that brutality there the, the east and the west and the yeah. constant battles and these and these people these uh, you know in the peasants you know yeah. kind of always being the ones who were actually suffering right right you know you get you get the because it's portrayed that that very concept is portrayed by uh, the general mm -hmm. um, Jacek uh, yeah Jacek yeah fantastic Jacek Lenatovich yeah he's a, an amazing Polish uh, actor and uh, he has a great really just menacing presence and you know he, he also but he's also he's a very you know kind of 
fun character in the film. He's, you know, he's at the top of the pyramid in this in this little town of Styria, which is where the film takes place. And, you know, things are great for him. You know, he's at the top. He gets anything he wants. So he has no reason to be dark or unhappy. It's everyone else who's suffering. And so he has he's this great kind of. Uh, bubbly personality because <laughs> life's life life's going it's never going to get better than right. you know it does for him and, and actually in poland uh he's a he's a pretty big personality he's actually a, a announcer for wrestling yeah. and because he's got this great yes, uh, deep voice, voice. Yeah. and he you know he just was when he came onto the film he just had this you know he's a lot like his character he's just this fun guy to be around and yeah. everyone just enjoyed uh you know him, him, his character and his drinking, and he also was a little superstitious himself. He didn't really like to fly. He took the train from Poland <laughs> instead of flying, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, he had his own little journey. Yeah, yeah I like everyone; the they're on little ticks, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, was, you know, one thing I, I liked about his character is it's, uh, you know, from the story, there, there is a general in there, mm -hmm. and uh, what you, what I thought you took from the story, the fearlessness. That the general have mm -hmm. uh, because uh, in your film he's from the area mm -hmm. he knows what's happening he he goes and he's you know he's not afraid of the people because the people are afraid of him but he also is unafraid of the super oh, you know the perceived supernatural mm -hmm. you know he, he knows what's here i feel like this is my hometown i know sure. what's here i'm here in my position not because i'm a great general mm -hmm. but because i know how to deal yeah, with you know these situations, physical and metaphysical. Yeah, you know was, that was that was I, I love that about that. Yeah, you know, tell me about that. You know. Yeah, his, his so in the in the film he's you know he's kind of sent from Moscow to kind of deal with these these peasants that and you know and you know you deal with the uh, use an iron hand and everyone kind of falls into line. You don't really need to worry about it. Um, and he's through most of the film very confident, but then you know he starts realizing or you know he. He uh, some you know he gets he gets his uh, come up come up and says it were when he doesn't really read the situation correctly anymore right. and uh, yeah he was he's it's it's kind of great to have that big pompous built up character um, who is not reading things as well as they possibly should because it's never come up come up before you know right. uh, you, you you're dealing if you're dealing with superstitious peasants you just deal with them harshly and you you know every other time in his life it's gone it's gone well right. Um, yeah, we like that character and that character, the idea of, of power and someone controlling it. And there's a, in the, one of the things we really wanted to set apart from Dracula, and really all the vampire films that came before, and I, you know, there's been a huge amount of vampire films of late, especially, um, and then they all kind of draw from the same kind of cliches that came out of Dracula. Right. And we wanted to avoid that argument of, or, and really kind of say, well, before Dracula, a vampire was almost as much a spirit or as uh, as it was physical, you know. But it was always had a draining and psychological presence that was very that was very much a real threat. And so, you know, the the uh, the general is one kind of masculine figure. And then there are these women in the film, Lara, Carmilla, and the villagers, who have their own power. That if the masculine and the feminine aren't in balance, and the, you know the general's knocking everything around and just making everything his masculine world, well, there, there's women. You know, as, yes. as uh, Game of Thrones says, that women, uh, poison is a woman's weapon. You know, and they'll they'll find <laughs> a way. Psychological poison. Yeah, absolutely. Any kind of poison. I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> there's there's an old proverb. Uh, what was it? Um, the man is better sitting on the edge of his roof than um, having a wife that quarrels with him. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> you know, something like that, but it's like, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting because you, you have um, you, a, a line in the story. You're talking about uh, uh, Camilla says there are two type of men, you know, mm -hmm. the, the fool and the, the brute. The fool and the beast. The yeah, beast. that's right. The that's beast. right. Thank you. And it's interesting because... As I was watching the film, you literally have those things because you know yeah, they absolutely. call them. And you know, I, I've always looked for you know in stories the balanced man. Mm -hmm. The and I don't know maybe it's because it's a, a Western culture, but it's the uh, it's the Sam Elliott types. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones that do what they have to do, and yeah. then the the one who opens the door for the lady and yeah. takes care of the babies and a gentleman. Exactly, very nice. Yeah, and you know, just talking about that. You know, you have that. That is lacking 
because you have the fool who's just caught up. Stephen Ray is just caught up in his own thing. Yeah. You know, the intellectual. And yeah. then you have the, you know, the beast, uh, yeah. the general. Uh, and then it seems like the ladies come and fill that void, uh, like you were mentioning. And I mm -hmm. thought, you know, that's that's pretty interesting. And then they manipulate it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's you know, it, I'm sure. I think we're also writing from that high school perspective. It seems like there's, you know, the, the, the jock. jocks that you know like run <laughs> things, and then there are the, uh, the the nerds who are fascinated with their own little uh, you know, yeah, yeah. world. They and, create the apps, and <laughs> yeah, and and in high school, you know, no one's really you know got it figured out how to just be like a man, you know. Cool, yeah, right. And we figure out, you know, we kind of admire that, you know, man. Uh, righteous man or chivalrous or nice yeah um but uh yeah and you know that's 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 what they, that's and it, you want that in a different kind of story in this in this story you know it is about that imbalance it yeah. is about because in that void yes it's going to be filled by something yes and uh you know the the you know you're, you're better off when the masculine and feminine feminine are in balance right because if not something bad's going to happen either way right which is, you know i don't, I don't want to give anything away but i feel saying that where I was heading towards was um, Professor Hill and Laura at balance at one at the end yeah balance They're yeah they, they meet that uh, it's that male female understanding and they balance each other sure and then there's an extra layer of father and daughter of balance which I thought was that was great yeah you know, in, in that respect you know all this chaos and what it comes back down to, I guess, love. You know, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's a it's a great balancing thing. And the other and the other thing is, you know, as a teenager, you know, there is it that great Jungian word, individuation, where you come into your own, yeah. and suddenly, you know, your parents <laughs> are used to treating you as a child, and you have to rebel and push back a certain amount in order nice. to say, no, I'm I'm not this. And you actually, you know, you have to push back farther to figure out where your boundaries are. Right. And then you kind of come into your own a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, Laura does a little more than push in this, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's, there's, you, you have know, to figure it out. Yeah, because you, you, it would make sense because he's not just being a father; he's also being a protector, and you know, n not just a nurturer, but also trying to develop. You know, there's a lot that's going on within him. Sure. Besides the regular, you know, father-daughter uh, aspect, you have yeah. you know, all the history that he knows about that she doesn't know about. Uh, yeah, and no he's, box. you know, he's working under a deadline and he's got this pressure <laughs> to, is. like, try and do this great work. And, you know, I'm a I'm a, a father of two, you know, daughters. And, you know, I, there's all times where, like, I know I should probably be out playing with them. But, you know, you have a job that you're going to get fired from if you don't if you don't do things properly. Yes. And so I, I think I think I, I certainly have that guilt. You know, yes. my, um, when we went to shoot in Hungary, my uh, we only had one daughter and she was one years old. And, you know, she yeah. was like this, you know, the, the stress on the set and dealing with all the things. You know, we had a crew of people from Poland and uh, Hungary and Mexico and the United States. And so there were a lot of languages going on. Wow. And, uh, and those little breaks where I could go and play with my daughter, I suddenly, I felt a little bit of balance. You yeah. know, I felt uh, a little calmed wow. down. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. you know, children can do that to you again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it was the, you know, you you have that story, that element, mm -hmm. and then, you know, for an, you know, a normal, you know, father-daughter or you know, parent relationship, there isn't a metaphysical aspect. <laughs> Generally, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, which how in how impossible that would seem to a person who's dealing with just you know normal teenage rebellion, mm -hmm. to then find out, you know, they're off. You know, doing this, I don't know, witch hunt or what yeah. have you. You know, and, and you have that in there. You know, because yeah. that's what the whole story is about. You got this whole it's thing. It's overwhelming enough just to have a teenage <laughs> daughter, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. the metaphysical. And, you know, there's also, that's another kind of other, where you're this, the parent and you're used to them. And suddenly they start sneaking off and developing their own secret right. world or language. And in the yeah. case of Curse of Styria, it's a, it's a great deal more menacing and hostile than just, you know, going down to the local <laughs> drinking spot. And, right, yeah, right. You're going to have a cigarette with your friend outside or yeah, something. Yeah, these, these minor <laughs> forms of rebellion in, in the Curse of Styria, it's, it's quite a, another matter where the entire town's going mad. It, it, right. You know, it, you know, and for me, I think I mentioned earlier that Stephen Ray was kind of an anchor mm -hmm. L seeing things and not seeing things yeah you know but you know for the, for the film itself for this you know how you projected it he was the one that kind of kept everything 
even tone. Yeah. His, his performance, his manner, the way he dealt with everything. You know, when as there, everything was arising, he, as the actor, you know, gave you like, okay, it's. He's really calm about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but. Well, how, you know, how that's, that's, you that's how we're, you know, we all can like calm things down and, all, you know, deal with the teenage hysterics. It doesn't help to get too hysterical until, right. until you realize, you know, wait, this, this is, a, this is a little, this is something else, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the one of the things we are really liked about the, the original uh, novella is this relationship between the father and daughter. Nice. Yes. Um, that he's really, you know, Try, he, he's trying to control her in a certain way right. and she's not going to be controlled right. you know and if you you know push something back down enough it's going to come back spring loaded and uh, right. um, you know in the, in the movie uh, Stephen Ray's character has sent his daughter off to a uh, boarding school because he doesn't want to deal with her and she finds a way to get make him deal with her which is to get kicked out of the boarding school yeah. and has to go with him on this trip that he didn't didn't really want her on <laughs> <laughs> and he's forced to deal with her. And I think yeah. teenagers are amazing at that, getting, forcing us to deal with them, you yeah, know? Yeah, you bet. You bet. Like, I'm busy. You're like, oh, yeah, well, the house is on <laughs> fire. <laughs> you should probably five, five minutes to talk to me. I was just going to say that. The house is on fire. Yeah. Uh, you know, because you, you would wonder, one of the things I wondered, you know, as, as you're talking about that, if it didn't happen here, it would have happened somewhere else. Mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily, you know, this particular story, yeah. but their relationship, because it was, it's about them yeah. and how things affected them. You know, who knows what the other story might have been about. Yeah. But here they are, which created this dynamic, which, you know, opened itself up. We go somewhere, and we don't know what doors are going to open or what relationships or what's going to have you. Yeah. And what have you. But they go here and boom. Yeah. And then you explore that. And then there's multi layers of exploration. Yeah. And you know, it's it's kind of like that uh, that idea of like when the world's creation, you know, created there's so much just potential magic in the air when two coconut halves are torn apart, suddenly two gods form and right. this place, this steria is such just a uh, an alive kind of has this dark energy to it. Yeah. You know, the castle has this dark uh, these these hot springs flowing underneath that, you know, that are these, you know, Pretty, pretty obvious metaphor for something bubbling underneath, and it's slowly yeah. gonna flood the place. And yeah, it, 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 you you kind of embellish it and exaggerate it to kind of make the um, symbolic literal in horror films. And I think that's what horror films do best. And you know, gothic. This is a gothic thriller that has those horror elements that. Mm -hmm. It takes the literal, it takes the the symbolic and makes it literal, and then people are dealing with that. And when we go and see these these uh, horror films, they those those symbols need to resonate with something that we've thought about or that we've dealt with or not dealt with. Right. Usually, you know, one of the things I liked about the film was it, it wasn't one of these campy horror films mm -mm. that are coming out. Yeah. There, for me, it was you know the psychological aspect, the approach of you know the the vampire the vampire lore mm -hmm. and teenage sexuality and father uh, father daughter dynamic or parent dynamic and then you know it, it, we we brush, uh, brushed on it but the effect of community those outside forces mm -hmm. that you know, like you mentioned high school you know yeah. we, we may be the the nerdy kid that's out and wants to be part of the the group but the group doesn't want to accept us so you know yeah go run around the track in your shorts 10 times and then you can be part of the group and then, yeah. then you have the bullies and then you have and you ex, you know you explored you explored that mm -hmm. um, tell me about that because you know there's you, you hit on it you know mm -hmm. but it's it was it's quick but it's not quick Hmm. You, you make your own assumptions about you know the group, you know the, the villagers. And such. Sure. So so uh, Carmilla is based it was uh, the novella was based in um, this region of Austria called Styria, which was like this magical dark region that like you know is uh, and you know now we think of Austria as you know uh, you know quite quite polite. It's actually where um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is from, Styria. Yes. <laughs> but we went there and it's it's a quite a uh, actually the location scout and it's an amazing spot. But we set made the village called uh, Styria because this beautiful world that, word that uh, you know has you know Stygian aspects or hysteria and 
um, that's that's where we got the name from. It just suggests some psychological darkness. And the community is this community, this farming community that's always been there and just know their lot is to suffer, whether they were serfs or whether it was under communism or whether, you know, it was under the uh, the, the, what, the Wallachs, not the Wallachs, the um, uh, Bavoids or something, you know, the right. Counts. Um, uh, you know, of the region. They're, they're always there to suffer, and so this community kind of forms and knows that every once in a while, and this was an, another interesting idea that, you know, in the ancient Greek times, one day a year, the women were allowed to run wild, and any man that was caught on the streets uh, at this time was literally be torn apart. It was called the Bacchanal, you yes. know. And uh, the, uh, uh, this idea that, you know, you repress the feminine, and then one that day a year, they can they can go crazy and do anything they want, and that's kind of what happens in this town is they're repressed and they're pushed down, but they'll find a way to eventually deal with it. And you know, there's I wouldn't say it's re revenge, but more retribution that right. that is permeating the film. Yes, uh, you, you know, you know, you're a wonderful, you know, wonderful glimpse into that because it psych, again back to psychology, it, it's always about you can't repress anything you know yeah. eventually you'll find its way out and yeah. yeah exactly that you know i think they mention every hundred years or whatever blah 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 yeah every period you know <laughs> and the, you know the um the in the in the film there's you know these these incident that's keep that keep happening and yes. there's on the on our actually website stereomovie.com there's like a timeline that represents that and all these little incidents that you know happen just around world war one or world war two or in this case you know the fall of the berlin wall where uh, it's almost like the ritual of spring or the rite of spring, where there's a bloodletting and then things can grow again. Right, know? right. You know, it, it, it's funny because every culture, like you had mentioned, has something. Some places, you know, you, you have to leave the leave the land alone for a, you know for a season, let yeah. it rejuvenate, and uh, we all we're all familiar with the Aztecs and Mayans, you know, the blood sacrifices yeah. and what have you. Or sacrifice a cow on the land, or give you know exactly the scapegoat, or you know even <laughs> not to get too crass, but you know once a month women have to have some bloodletting before a new life can come. You know yes, and that's yes. that's uh, certainly there in the film. That, that's when you want to stay away, like you were saying. Yeah, <laughs> stay locked in somewhere. Yeah, that's when that's when the stuff that for the other twenty eight days you've been. Uh, yeah, that's that's right. when it's going to come back to you. Yeah, uh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know that's that's one of the things uh, you know I enjoyed about the film it was the whole exploration of uh, the metaphysical, the, mm -hmm. the the psychological, and you know that it could be literally anywhere mm -hmm. because literally it has been everywhere in these suicide clusters, like you yeah. alluded to. That yes, it can happen and has happened in our modern era, except we just don't call it vampirism; we call it now. Uh, suicide clusters. Yeah, and in fact, in, in uh, New York State, uh, these girls began to have these tremors and these shakes, and they'd spread throughout, and they, no one could quite figure it out. But I think 36 women begin to have these like things, and it's no one can explain it physically. It's it's all psychological, but it's powerful. And we don't really like to think of the psychological. Psychological is powerful. We like to think of our bodies as powerful. We can handle this. But every <laughs> once in a while, you know, your unconscious comes and throttles your life, or, you know. You're right. Uh, uh, that these things still have an incredible power o over us, you know, yeah. that, you know, I could drum up a kind of hysteria, you know, or, or some, some factor could do it in the right uh, uh, circumstances where there's that kind of, like, Tangible, yeah. Um, ten, no, I don't want to say magic, but that that tension, yeah. The repression that right. it's ready to pop as soon as the pin yeah. is, yeah. or the camel, you know. Yeah, I think well, I think it's like it's modern marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they they throw certain images towards us to you know tintillate us and you yeah. know get us excited and you know the, the whole teenage frenzy thing. Yeah. Again, it's always the teenager. What's the, what's the choice demographic that, you know, why? Because they want them to, you know, buy the product and stay through yeah. the product for the rest of their lives. But you think, what psychologically, at what point do you mature and say, you know, I, I'm no longer going to buy that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to buy you know, the store brands just as good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> at a certain point. Well, yeah, you know, the teenagers have that impulse and that energy yeah. and just yeah. like, I need this now and, yeah. there's, you know, there is no tomorrow, you know, there's... <laughs> Teenagers, there's there is no tomorrow, but yeah. yet somehow de there's no death either. You know? Right. Yeah. And uh, you know, we all we all kind of like calm down. But it's yeah, I think it's that journey of of individuation of where you emerge of 
the trauma of like your teenage years. You know, yeah. I have friends who are still trying to figure out how to get out of their high school trauma. Uh, you know, like yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, we all have scars of one form or another. We, you know, you may mention something to someone, they're like, "Really? Get over it." Yeah. And then they'll say something to you that bothers you yeah. really get over it you know? yeah we can all we all have even if we have perfect parents you know the trauma you have to get over is having perfect parents that uh, introduce you to the horrible world and, you know? yeah, yeah. the whole world of, of wealth and prestige or you know education you know they yeah. want you to do well i hated doing good so i went and got bad grades yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly oh well, you know we're reaching the end but you know the, the, there's so much to talk about mm -hmm. um you know we just just scratch the surface because you can really it's a class in itself because you really can dive into you know the characters yeah you know, j just the movie not the not, not the actors and their performances but the story yeah and and, and uh, you know each character and where they're being drawn from you know there's a lot really that you can uh, yeah and we really try to infuse it with that that layers or you know approach it as literature and that there's images and symbology and it's some it's a great film to see and talk with someone about yeah. and uh, I hope uh, I hope everyone can see it go to the website stereomovie.com to see when uh, it's gonna be played could I also mention that it's gonna be played at the Bram Stoker of Festival course in Dublin, Ireland on October 24th at 6 p.m. and it's part of a fun, uh, they're actually gonna have live readings of uh, Dracula and uh, Carmilla at the festival. So it's Fantastic. it should be a great place to see. It's also uh, where Stephen Ray's from and lives. So <laughs> it's, got that, it's got that great <laughs> Irish darkness. <laughs> and of course on Facebook, Twitter, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. F just Styria, Styria movie, Curse of Styria is the name of the film. And uh, yeah. And uh, how about you? You have um, some upcoming projects? I know you teach. I know yeah. you, you love editing. You do you all know, sorts I'm, of things. I'm kind of deep in the Halloween thing right now. I'm just finishing a film about giant pumpkin growers that nice. uh, a documentary and they grow a 2032 pound pumpkin over the course of it. But it's really about America's history and love of the pumpkin. It's actually the gourd. Pretty, <laughs> of the gourd. It's a pretty, pretty potent symbol. Yeah, because they have contests and they get huge, 2,000 pounds or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. There's big enough. Then people hollow them out and row, put them in the ocean or in lakes and, and have contests in them. And, really? Oh, oh yeah. that I didn't know. Someone took one down the Colorado River in Moab and we have that in the film. It's pretty fun. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a that's rise of the giants movie dot com. That's a, that's a different one. I don't want to mix them up. That's a documentary. That's a, that's a fun one. That's oh. the one I had to to cleanse myself with with all the darkness of Styria. <laughs> Deal with giant pumpkins. Yeah, I love it. Something a little friendly. And, and uh, is that is that hitting the film festivals next year? Or is that uh... um, that's it's it's being it's being played all over right now, and we're oh, also okay. you know it's going to be on Beautiful. VOD uh, in October. You know, cause, oh nice. Yeah, it's okay. it's the time. Yeah, it's we the can time look when for people it. care about pumpkins. <laughs> that's right, Mark. Again, Ed, you know, thanks for coming in and sharing the uh, the story and uh, about yourself too. You know, uh, looking forward to even uh, the pumpkin project. Got to see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mark, again, appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Nice meeting you. Thank you. you. Bet, yeah. Hey, well, this is Gus Summers, and you've been listening to The In Show. We have in studio guest, Mr. Mark Devendorf, and we've been talking about his film, The Curse of Styria. And you'll be able to check out his interview, of course, at theinshow.com, where you'll be able to catch uh, everything that he's doing and will be doing. Of course, look for us also on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, Pinterest, uh, Flickr, all those great social media sites. Of course, visit us at theinshow.com. We'll be able to catch up on everything that uh, we have been doing and will do. And, of course, ladies and gentlemen, Gus has left the building.